everyone and welcome to another talk in the Life in the Universe pandemic series for all of you out there isolated or self-isolated uh, dealing with the current pandemic or indeed for anyone else out there uh, not part of the pandemic but just interested in some of the big questions in astrobiology, the study of life in the universe. So today I want to talk about a question that seems a little bit relevant uh, today. Will samples from Mars cause a pandemic? And this is a, a, a rather terrifying but interesting question uh, and it revolves around the idea that if we go to another planet and collect some samples, maybe for scientific study, and we bring them back to the Earth, will they unleash some terrible disease like coronavirus from another world that would infect the biosphere, infect humans and cause devastation to our civilization? Well, you'll be glad to know uh, right from the beginning that people have actually thought about this for a long time and it falls under the general title of planetary protection, a rather grandiose, uh, almost um, Hollywood sounding name for protecting the planet, planetary protection. In fact, some people think that we spend too much time thinking about the questions of whether uh, a pandemic would be caused by collecting samples from elsewhere or whether we will go and destroy another biosphere on another planet. Uh, so that gives you some indication of the extent to which people have thought about these things. So the question is, could collecting samples from another planet and bringing them back to Earth cause a pandemic? Before we address that question, maybe we should address another question, which is why would anyone want to collect samples from another planet in the first place? Well, one of the reasons why planetary scientists, astrobiologists and, and other scientists want pristine samples from other planets is so that they can get samples that have not been affected by uh, the processes of drifting through space, for example. Uh, we have many Martian meteorites. That might surprise you uh, that we actually have pieces of Mars already, uh, for example, in our labs. Uh, a long time ago, when asteroids and comets collided with Mars, they threw pieces of rock into space, and those bits of rock uh, drift through space and eventually land on the Earth. And we can tell that they come from Mars because the rock composition of the meteorites is similar to volcanic rocks we find on Mars. But even more telling, uh, we can find in those meteorites tiny bubbles of gas that were trapped when that rock was melted as it was ejected in the intense heat of impact as it launched from Mars. And those little bubbles contain gas from Mars. And I have to say, as a, as a non-geologist, I find it remarkable to think that there are rocks on the Earth that contain within them little bubbles of Martian atmosphere. Uh, but they do indeed, and scientists manage to extract these gases and they can look at the composition and they can see that the elements within these gases and the isotopic signatures, an isotope uh, is a uh, particular type of an element, different types of the same element, they can show that these values are exactly the same as in the Martian atmosphere as measured by rovers uh, at, that we've sent to the surface of Mars. So we know that we have samples of Mars on the Earth, so we can actually do a lot of science studying um, the surface of Mars and, and other planetary bodies using meteorites. But the problem with meteorites is they're not very pristine. They've drifted through space, they've landed on the Earth, some of them have sat around in the Antarctic ice sheet for many years being uh, colonized by microbes and, and exposed to the, to the wind and the rain. And what we really want is nice fresh samples. So there's a great deal of interest in this general area called sample return. Going to Mars, going to asteroids, going to the moon, collecting nice fresh samples and bringing them back to laboratories so that scientists can study these samples without all those extra complications of the samples being affected. And this is why there's such enthusiasm for collecting samples. And indeed, the Mars 2020 rover uh, that will be going to uh, Mars soon, uh, one of its objectives is to collect samples that will later be uh, cached and brought back to Earth in a Mars sample return mission. So there's no doubt that we have a lot of interest in collecting these samples, and samples have already been collected from the Moon. The Russians brought back uh, lunar samples um, in, in the 70s. There, was also, there have also been uh, missions to collect asteroid and comet samples, and we will collect more samples, and particularly from Mars. And the reason why Mars tends to concern people uh, more than other planetary bodies is because it may be a place that hosted or hosts life 
even in the present day. And if you're unsure about that or you don't know much about uh, the ideas about life on Mars, you can look at the lecture number two in this series where I talk about some of the ideas about um, looking for life on Mars and the prospects for life on Mars. So samples from Mars cause people particular concern because they think, well, if that's a planet that has life, maybe there are some nasty bugs in those samples that could come back to Earth. So what are the probabilities of, of, um, uh, of bringing back uh, dangerous microbes from Mars. Well, first of all, we might want to think about what sort of life uh, would we find on Mars if there's any life there at all. And there are really two types of life that we could find on Mars. We could find life that is related to life on Earth. That is that there was an origin of life in the early history of the solar system. That life was thrown out into space in asteroid and comet impacts and exchanged between the planets. So although we know there's life on Earth, maybe there's life on Mars and maybe it's related to life on Earth because we all came from a common origin. Or we might find um, an independent origin of life on Mars if there's any life there at all. Uh, life that evolved completely independently with a novel biochemistry. But either way, whether that life is related to life on Earth or whether it's completely novel biochemistry, it's very unlikely to cause a pandemic in the way that we think about a pandemic uh, in the sense of coronavirus. And that is because most viruses that cause uh, bad diseases, even bacteria that cause diseases, are highly co-evolved with their hosts. What does that mean? That means that these viruses and bacteria tend to evolve side by side. So a virus will attack human beings and human beings will develop an immunity to those viruses and then the viruses will have to mutate if they want to get into the human immune system or bypass the human immune system. So mutate they do and they invade our immune system and we develop a response. So things tend to co-evolve. It takes a great deal to evade the human immune system and get into our, our bodies. Uh, the human body is exquisitely evolved for making sure that nasty things don't get in. Otherwise, we'd all be dropping dead very quickly every day. The fact that you can walk around on the street and breathe in viruses and soot and all sorts of foreign particles from the atmosphere without dropping dead is testament to the immune system that has evolved within you over many, many millions of years in, in previous organisms and creatures uh, from which we are descended that have evolved this immune system. So it actually takes quite a lot to get through the human immune system and many of the viruses and bacteria that can do that have evolved uh, side by side with us or at least in uh, organisms, creatures that are similar to us. So we do know of viruses that can jump the species barrier and of course uh, one idea about the origin of the coronavirus is that it came from bats or pangolins. So there's no doubt that viruses can cross the species barrier, but that barrier is not very large when you think about the fact that uh, pangolins and bats are, are evolved on the earth and they are mammals that have evolved uh, similarly to us. So the jump is not that huge. It's an entirely different matter when you speculate about a life form from the planet Mars coming to earth and being able to invade the human immune system. In fact, the most likely scenario is that even if you did have a sample from Mars that contained a life form, if it was dispersed in the atmosphere, your body would probably just treat it like a foreign particle, like a soot particle or a piece of dust in the atmosphere, recognize it as foreign and destroy it. Uh, that particle would be unlikely to possess the genetic information or its equivalent to be able to evade your immune system. So in general, uh, we think that the idea that something from another planet would cause a pandemic in a virus-like way is extremely unlikely. But I say as, as a scientist, extremely unlikely. No one would be foolish enough to say 100% impossible because that would be a very dangerous thing to say. And as a result, people do actually take this seriously. And when samples are going to be collected on Mars, uh, there are regulations, planetary protection regulations, on what we call back contamination, preventing the Earth from being back contaminated by organisms from another planet. And those sorts of regulations include that the samples must be contained in a sample return capsule that must not have contact with the outside atmosphere. Uh, those samples must be taken into a laboratory uh, that is one of the highest levels of biological containment, the sort of laboratory that you study coronavirus in or Ebola, uh, a laboratory that is designed for studying extremely dangerous diseases. And the first samples to come back from Mars will be studied in laboratories with this level of containment. And then when people are satisfied that there is either no life in the samples or if there is life, and that would be very exciting, that it's not dangerous, we can carry out toxicology tests, for example, on that life, then those samples can be released to other universities and institutes to study. 
So you should be uh, rest assured that there's a very low likelihood of any alien creature, if it's out there, causing a pandemic. And even if there was, uh, there are a large number of, of regulations and um, a great deal of thought that goes into how to study these samples without them being released into the environment in a dangerous way, however unlikely a pandemic is. Uh, so that's, that's the good news. There are other things that one might want to think about, though, other than pandemics. Imagine that you collected a sample on Mars and it came from, I don't know, the, the, the cold subsurface of Mars. You drilled into the sur subsurface of Mars into an environment where there's very little food, but there are some microbes down there eking out a living, just about getting by. And you put those in a capsule and you send them to the Earth and the capsule goes off course and it crashes in the Arctic and the capsule opens up and the microbes come out, these cold adapted Martian microbes. And what do they find? They find a, a nice, cool Arctic environment, a little, little bit like Mars, but unlike Mars, lots of food, lots of organic material. This is heaven for them. And they start dividing and, and replicating and, and taking over the Arctic environment. Uh, again, we don't have any particularly strong evidence that that could happen, but, one sh but that's a more likely scenario than a pandemic, simply because we do have evidence of animals taking over environments that they are not normally uh, evolved to, to have lived in. For example, rats on ships uh, moving into islands and, and eating seabird eggs. There are many examples of, of animals that we've inadvertently released into islands and other environments that have caused great ecological destruction. The truth is we actually don't know uh, how likely a microbe is to be able to take over other microbes and destroy an ecosystem. So could a Martian microbe move into an Earth environment and take over that environment? We don't know. It's probably more likely than a pandemic because it merely requires uh, a microbe that will find an environment suitable for growth. It doesn't require this co-evolution with a human immune system. So we should be careful about that. We should be careful not to dump pristine Martian samples, uh, particularly if they turn out to contain life in environments on the Earth uh, without very much knowing what's going on in them. So this is the concern of bat contamination. And people think about that. And that's another reason for uh, opening up Martian samples in highly contained laboratories to make sure not that they don't attack humans, which is extremely unlikely, but that they just don't get into the environment generally and grow somewhere where you don't want them to grow. So you can rest assured that people think about these things and they've thought about them a lot. And uh, space agencies have planetary protection working groups and planetary protection officials who think about uh, how we should treat samples coming back from other planets. And again, these concerns are, are highly unlikely to be manifested in the real world, um, but uh, one can never be 100% sure. So people are taking appropriate um, uh, uh, precautions on the return of samples. Another aspect of planetary protection which is worth exploring is, is forward contamination. This is the other aspect of planetary protection that concerns the fact that we might take microbes from the Earth and contaminate another planetary body with a biosphere. Let's say Mars has life and we land a spacecraft and we contaminate that planet with microbes on our own spacecraft. Uh, that would not be dangerous for the Earth, but it would be bad for that planet. And it would be bad from several points of view. First of all, it might compromise our own scientific investigations. Imagine you spend billions of dollars sending a spacecraft to go to Mars and look for life. And then a microbe drops off your spacecraft, grows around your spacecraft, you detect life, you publish all these wonderful papers saying that you've discovered life on Mars, and it eventually turns out that you've just discovered life on Earth that you took with you. No one wants to waste that sort of money. Uh, no one wants to compromise scientific investigations. Planetary protection regulations uh, that were conceived in the 1950s were primarily conceived with this problem in mind uh, about the destruction of what we might call scientific resources, the destruction of potentially uh, interesting life on other planets that we might want to study. In other words, we should clean our spacecraft to avoid compromising the possibility of studying alien life and also because we don't want to end up uh, with a false positive detection of life, detecting life that we brought to Earth. So space agencies spend a lot of time and effort thinking about these things. And one of the things they do is clean their spacecraft. If you're going to send a spacecraft 
to a place on Mars that might harbor life, or at least might be capable of supporting life, then you sterilize it. And the Viking landers that went to Mars in the 1970s were cooked like giant turkeys for several hours at high temperature to kill off any microbes on their surfaces and to reduce the numbers of microbes to a certain level that was considered acceptable uh, for a mission to Mars. And nowadays, uh, planetary protection regulations uh, split planets up into different categories depending upon the likelihood that scientific investigations could be compromised. So if you're going to the moon, for example, the moon is very unlikely to have life. People are less concerned about that. And so spacecraft have to be less clean than if they go to Mars, for example, where we think there might be uh, habitable environments or, or there, there could be habitable environments somewhere on that planet. So forward contamination uh, is a great deal of concern, and mainly for scientific reasons, or at least that was the, the, uh, the regulations were conceived to deal with science. People are now worried about ethical aspects of planetary protection, so even if we don't um, destroy our own scientific investigations on a planet like Mars, surely we should be concerned about the local microbes if they're there on Mars. Is it not unethical to go to Mars with a spacecraft, shed some microbes, and destroy a Martian biosphere. Who cares about the science? You're destroying a biosphere. Is that unethical? Is it not unethical to destroy uh, Martian microbes? Well, that's an interesting scientific question. Should we care about microbes? After all, you bleach microbes every day uh, in your house. You clean your house out. You, you kill microbes when you take a shower. So why would you care about Martian microbes? Well, some people think that Martian microbes are just doing their own thing. If they're there, they're doing their own thing, living on Mars, uh, living out their lives. We should leave them alone. So there are ethical questions in planetary protection as well. Should we be concerned about other biospheres, as well as uh, trying to protect scientific investigations concerned about the ethics of other microbes. So this whole area of planetary protection is enormously interesting, and of course it does encompass this one question of will microbes from another planet cause a pandemic on the Earth? So just to summarize, I don't think that's likely. Uh, I'm a scientist, I won't say it's 100% impossible, but it's about as unlikely as you could possibly be, uh, given the knowledge, but that's not to say uh, knowledge that we have. That's not to say that we shouldn't be concerned about it and we shouldn't take appropriate precautions. And it's not to say we shouldn't think about all the other aspects of planetary protection, not just infecting our own planet, but taking life that we do know exists on the Earth and infecting uh, other planets, either destroying our own scientific investigations or on a more ethical level, concerns about um, infecting and disrupting biospheres on other planets if they exist at all. So that gives you some idea about um, the, the relevance of the current pandemic to thinking about life on Mars and other planetary bodies. And we'll think maybe about some of these questions more in future talks. So thanks for joining me again. Take care of yourselves and we'll speak in future lectures.